Shall we pray the prayer for illumination together in unison? Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, and in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's scripture verses are taken from the book of James, chapter 1, verses 22 to 27. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting that they have what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Brother Chin Tiong. Good morning, church. You all feel very sleepy, lah. Okay, let's try this again. Why every week I have to, write, I have to repeat this one like, every week? Every week I'll come up and say good morning and you guys will be so uh, lackluster. Okay, let's try this. And next week also, uh, tr- without reminder, okay? Good morning, church. Okay, that's much better. All right, uh, we are continuing our series this morning on the uh, counterfeit series. And as we saw last week in the introduction, you know, we are talking about counterfeits. That is basically the practices in our Christian lives that looks real, smells real, sounds real, but it is just missing its genuine element. It's like what Paul says, we have a form of godliness, but we miss the power of it. We miss the essence of it. We miss what is genuine about it. And last week we saw that counterfeits will give us a false sense of security, which will lead to complacency. Like many of us, you know, when we have a counterfeit practice in our life, as we will see later in the sermon, we will then fall into this mode of, you know, I'm, 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 I'm safe, I'm assured, I, I'm, I'm guaranteed, I'm secure, when in reality all you have is a counterfeit practice and it's just a matter of time before that counterfeit practice uh, burns your house down or, or the sort. And we saw last week as well that many times we choose to maintain the counterfeits in our life because we settle for the lesser because we are not willing to pay for the price for the genuine. And oftentimes we wait until consequences strike and then we only realize that we had to, we should pay for what's genuine. Last Thursday, one of my DG members shared with me, he was telling the story of how he went and buy his, his handphone charger when spoiled. And so he went to buy a replacement charger. And so he went to the original, to the original store, the replacement charger is like 100 ringgit, 100 plus. And so, what for pay so much? Go to Pasar Malam, get a cheap $10 uh, charger instead. And what happens is after buying the cheap one, the counterfeit version, after using it for a couple of weeks, because the counterfeit version, the, the, the contact point is not uh, done properly, what happened in the end, he damaged his phone's contact point. And instead, he had to send his phone for repair, which cost a lot more than buying the original charger. And sometimes that's what we do. We wait till consequences happen before we realize that the counterfeits in our lives are dangerous to keep, dangerous to maintain. And so today we're going to go through the first 
part of this whole series and we're going to talk about counterfeit maturity. But before that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all honour and all glory. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your love, for your grace and for your mercy. And we pray that this, if this morning they're going to help us to, to open our eyes and our ears to recognise the counterfeit maturity in our lives. Lord, help us not to be so comfortable in our complacency, to be comfortable, to be so secured in the false, false securities that we have. But help us, Lord, to really realize the counterfeits that we carry in our lives. Lord, I just commit each and every one of us here unto your hands. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, counterfeit is a very old uh, trait. It's a very old profession. In fact, the oldest form of counterfeit is uh, when the people counterfeit money. That is the oldest form of counterfeit. In fact, counterfeiting money is also known as the world's second oldest profession. You all know what the first oldest profession is, right? And so counterfeit is, is, is that old. And it's been, it's been around ever since money was invented. If you look at world history, money came about in around 600 BC in the Greek city of Lydia, uh, the Asia Minor city of Lydia. They invented money using coins like those days. You know, they will say, okay, uh, a gold coin is worth one milligram in gold. And so they make a gold coin with one milligram of gold. And so that was the original money in the Greek. And immediately when money came out, people has already begun to counterfeit the money. And so what they do is rather than taking a real silver coin, which is 100% silver, in those days, as early as 600 BC, they've, take, they've taken, even before the tech, modern technology of plating and all those type of things, what they do is they will replace the base core with a cheap metal and cover it with silver. So rather than having a 100% silver coin, counterfeiters in those days already are counterfeiting it with maybe 25% silver and 75% copper instead. And so you see, you know, counterfeits a very long time. And like most counterfeits, it ain't entirely fake. You know, like, like those days when they counterfeit coins. Coins are 25% silver, 75% copper. There is still silver in them. There is still something genuine there. But it is just not the full range. It's not the full percentage. There's still 25% silver in it. And normally, counterfeits have something real in it. There's something that looks real in it, but it's not entirely real. It's just 25%. And the same is true when it comes to counterfeit maturity. There is always that 25% element that may be real, but we just don't have the fullness of what maturity is all about. We still have 75% fake uh, or counter 75% counterfeit in our lives. And, we should, and the, when it comes to maturity, very often, would you write me the first point of your notes is this, that we often counterfeit maturity with age or knowledge. With age or knowledge. You see, friends, they're not the same thing, you know. We, knowledge and maturity ain't the same thing. And, we, and, we, and, and it's, it's just like saying that someone is clever but not wise. We know very well that intelligence or being clever is not the same as being wise. They are totally different things altogether. It's like the story of this uh, engineer. He went on the aeroplane and he met another, a, younger, a much younger engineer. And they were on the flight, a uh, long haul flight for 12 hours. And this young engineer was very, he's very intelligent, he's very clever, he got a, he got a, lot, a lot of data, a lot of knowledge, and he just wanted to uh, prove it to this old engineer. And he said to him, you know, let's play a game. I'll, you ask me any question, and if I can't answer, I give you five dollars. And if you, and then I'll ask you a question, if you can't answer, you give me five dollars. The old engineer just didn't want to entertain, he just wants to sleep. But the young engineer just wanted to show off how much he knows and say, okay, okay, fine. If you ask me a question, if I can't answer, I'll pay you $50. If you, if, then, then I will ask you a question and if you can't, if you can't answer my question, you pay me 
five dollars. Well, the older engineer thought that's a good deal, right? So he got up and said, "Okay, here's my question: What goes up the mountain in four in three legs and comes down with four legs?" The young engineer was like, he went on his laptop. He went to the internet. He went to Google. He went every resource he could. He he WhatsApp every friend he knows. He went all over the world to search the answer. And after one hour of searching, 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 he couldn't get the answer. So he turned to the engineer and said, "Okay, you win." Took out fifty dollars and gave to the older engineer. Then the older engineer took the money, went back to sleep. And the young engineer was saying, "Hey, hey, what's the answer?" Without saying a word, the older engineer took out five dollars and gave it to the young engineer. <laughs> Sometimes you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you do not know how to use the knowledge, it ain't going to do you any good. And the same is true when it comes to maturity. Just because you know a lot, just because we know a lot in our head, we know a lot about the Bible, we know a lot about Christian doctrines, we know a lot about uh, what, what Christian living, we know a lot. But knowledge alone doesn't guarantee maturity. In fact, very often we get fooled by the devil that as long as I know a lot about God, I'm growing in maturity. Or in other words, if I'm growing in knowledge of God, then I'm growing in maturity. So as long as I manage to come to church on Sunday and I manage to hear a sermon, it's good enough. I'm being I'm being more matured because now I know one sermon more than I did last week. You know, I just did a calculation. You know, if you have been in church for twenty years, chances are you have heard about more than a thousand sermons. And some of you have been in church for like forty years, sixty years. You have heard like two, three thousand sermons in your life, and that's a ton of knowledge. That is a ton of knowledge in your head. And because we have listened to so many sermons, because we have been in church for so many years, we begin to think that I'm a matured person because I know so much more than I did twenty years ago. I know so much more than I did few years back, and I know so much more than that new guy. The new guy doesn't even know where Matthew, Mark, James is. At least I can find Habakkuk. I can find Obadiah. I know more. I know where they are in the Bible. And so we think we are more mature. And so what happened in churches today? In many, many churches today, throughout the West, throughout in Malaysia as well, that our churches today are filled with many knowledgeable Christians, with many long-time Christians, but very, very few mature Christians. We are filled with very knowledgeable Christians, but very few matured Christians. You see, friends, the danger is this: that if you continue to counterfeit maturity for knowledge, you continue to counterfeit sorry, you counterfeit knowledge for maturity too long. What happens is, firstly, you begin to think of yourself as more matured than others. You may not say it. Or you think that way, you would start thinking that you know, I'm actually quite mature. And what happens is, people who counterfeit maturity are usually very spiritually proud people. Spiritually very proud people who are very proud that they are more spiritual, they are more mature than others. Let me tell you, a true sign of maturity is humility. A true mark of spiritual maturity is always humility. But if you counterfeit knowledge for maturity, then what happens is in First Corinthians eight one it says, "Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies." Knowledge brings pride; it puffs the person up. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. In other words, if you think that your knowledge is is making you very mature, in reality, your knowledge is not what you should know. You actually know nothing. As far as God is concerned, you know nothing because true maturity always brings humility. And one test of humility, one test of humility, is offenses. Offenses. If you get offended easily. If you get offended often, you get offended every day in the week, or you get offended every alternate weeks. You get offended every month. You get offended every year, whether it be by the same person over and over again or by different people, doesn't matter. But if offense happens very regularly in your life, 
That's a sign of pride. Because oftentimes people who are proud only get, you only get offended. And by the way, uh, pride doesn't mean that you have, to have a lot of accomplishment to be pride, you know, proud, you know. People who have nothing can be very proud people as well. Likewise for spiritual people. You can have zero spiritual accomplishment, you can know the Bible very little, and you can still be spiritually very proud. And spiritually proud people will get offended very easily because you are infringing on my pride. You are insulting my pride. You are denting my pride. And so the first is you become, you begin to think of yourself as more mature than others. Secondly, you begin to tell people that you are more mature. You know, telling people that you are mature is like a wise man telling people they are wise. It just doesn't work. All right? And we don't say it out loud. We don't say, hey, you know, I'm a very mature Christian, you know. We don't. But how many times have I in ministry, I've met people who say things like, nah lah, this is not for me lah. I'm, this is for the new Christians lah. I'm older already. I don't need this lah. Oh, uh, no lah, I don't need to go back to, I don't need to go to learn a baptism class lah. I've been a Christian for so long. I know already lah. Please give me the fast track. Or sometimes we'll say things like, uh, you know, I'm not as uh, immature as that fella lah. You know, I, I, I know better. And many times, Christ, people who counterfeit maturity with knowledge will be people who will use this type of excuses. Many times, you, they use this type of excuses to justify why they don't need to do what they need to do. Because I've been there. I've done that. I used to do that. Now I don't need to do that anymore. I used to serve in that area. I don't need, I've graduated from that area to something else. And many times, we use that excuse, but it's just a front for a counterfeit maturity in our lives. And finally, if you continue in, your, in, in, in counterfeiting maturity, thirdly, you become very judgmental or very cynical to others. You begin to look at others and say, why this fellow behave like that one? Ah? Why this fellow, this, this fellow call himself a Christian? Ah? He's a leader somewhere, LCC member somewhere. Go and do this one. Ah. Ayo. He's a pastor. Ah. Say such things on the mouth. Hayo, how can? And we begin to judge people. We begin to be very cynical in the actions of others. How can this fellow stand up there? You know, I know he still drinks, uh, drinks alcohol at home. How can this fellow come into the church like that, just smoke outside there and then come into the church and worship God? How can he do this? We become very cynical. We become very judgmental. We begin to look at others as so unspiritual and we are the more spiritual ones. And so there's much danger in counterfeiting maturity with knowledge. So then, what is spiritual maturity? Okay, I'm not saying that knowledge is bad. Don't let me wrong. I never said that knowledge is bad. What I'm saying is that knowledge alone ain't good. Knowledge alone doesn't help. In fact, maturity requires knowledge. Remember what I say? 25% silver, it still needs 25% silver. It still needs knowledge. But the problem is, many of us, we just have knowledge alone and we think we are matured. It's like my children that time, you know, when they were young, we used to have this toy steering wheel, you know, a car that's steering wheel, right? They have this toy steering wheel and they have a little gearbox as well and they have all sorts of buttons. So they can turn the steering, they can put signal, turn left, they can change gear, vroom, and they can pretend. And with this steering wheel, you know, my little children when they're much younger, I mean, they're young now, but when they're much younger, you know, they will take the steering wheel, they sit there, and they say, look, daddy, I'm driving a car, I have a car, I'm driving a car. And I look at them and say, no, you have a steering wheel, you don't have a car, you just have a steering wheel. Okay, I know, like, I know they are kids, okay, but engineers think that way, okay. It's likewise in life, you know, it's like, it's like having what you have, where you, all you have is knowledge, and you think you, are, you have maturity, it's like, all you have is four wheels and you think you have a car. You go around and say, I got four wheels and just because I have four wheels, you think you have a car. But that's, the, that's reality and that's what happened to many, many Christians. So then what is maturity? Well, my definition of maturity, which you write in the next point of your notes, is this. Genuine maturity is the ability to discern the good from the evil, according to God, not according to your own standard, according to God's standard, to discern good from evil and to choose what is good and to choose what 
is good. You see, friends, the first part, to discern good from evil, that's discernment. That requires knowledge. That part requires knowledge. And the first step is you need to know. You need to know what is good and what is evil. But you know that the devil is not afraid of you knowing what is good and evil? In fact, the devil encourages you. Go and discover, go and find out. Because knowing good and evil is not a threat to the devil. Go back to Genesis chapter 2. Let me read to you. In the Garden of Eden, when God first created Adam and Eve, He says this, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Later on in verse chapter 3, Then the serpent said to the woman, said to Eve, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You see, the devil is never afraid of us knowing good or evil. In fact, the devil encouraged Eve, go and find out, go and eat the fruit so that you can know the difference between good and evil. Knowing the difference between good and evil ain't enough. That's why but we, need, we need to know yes, but it ain't enough because that alone is not a threat. But when we think that knowing good and evil is all that is to it, and that's what happened to Eve. Eve thought, as long as I know good and evil, I've got it. I'm there. She thought that's all it takes. And so she took the fruit and she ate it and we are where we are today. Okay? And so, it is good for you to not, uh, you need to, you need to move to the second part. And that second part is to choose, not just to discern the good from the evil and to choose what is good. At first, it may sound very redundant, right? Oh, to know good and evil and to choose what is good. I mean, logically, if you know good and evil, you should choose what is good, right? But then again, let's be very, very honest. How often do we know the difference between right and wrong? We know what is good and evil, but we just don't do it. Just because we know what is the right thing doesn't mean that we will do it. Isn't that true? It reminds me of the story of this, uh, this software engineer. He was... One day he was standing there uh, under a street light and he was on the floor looking for something. A policeman came by and asked him, what are you looking for? I lost my car keys. And so the policeman began to help him and look for it. And so they were looking all over under the street light, looking all over for the car keys. And after a while, after one hour, the policeman asked him, are you sure this is where you drop your keys? The software engineer looked at him and said, uh, no, actually I dropped it somewhere else. But then why are you looking here? Because this is where the light is, that's why I'm looking here. <laughs> Sometimes we think it's logical, right? That you should just... But not, not, not every time it works that way. Let's be honest. I know for certain, steaks ain't good. Salad, that's good. But I tell you any time, I will choose a steak over a salad any day. And I'm not going to feel guilty and regret about it. <laughs> I'll be honest. But isn't that true in our lives in many, many other areas? We don't always choose what is great, what is good. What differentiates a matured Christian and one who is just bloated with knowledge is the ability to choose the good, to, to, to discern the good, to choose the good according to God's will and do it and follow it and hold on to it and act on it. That's what makes the difference. Many of us, every one of us here seated here, after... Oh, you know, by the way, uh, this, is my fourth, this is the starting of my fourth year here. Really. I just counted, counted that day. For the last three years, you have been hearing me talk about disciple group. You have been hearing me talk about journaling. And I know that every one of you agrees in the back of your mind that, yeah, 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 discipleship group is good. Journaling is good. But yet, we know, although we know that disciple group is good, and we know that partying all night with our friends until we get drunk is bad, but yet, how often do we choose the later rather than the former? We know that journaling is good, that doing our devotions is good. And we know that watching TV and just laid back doesn't do you any good. But how many of us would still rather choose to watch TV and re relax rather than do our devotions? We know that spending time with our children is most important. 
to be there with them. Even if it's every day, you can spend 20 minutes, half an hour. As long as the consistent spending time being there with our children is good. But, and we know that work ain't good. We know that being motivated by money, being motivated by career, ain't very healthy. But yet, how often do we still choose work and career over spending that quality time with our children every day? We know that anger is evil. Anger is bad. It destroys relationship. We know that forgiveness brings healing. Forgiveness brings restoration. But how often do we still choose to be angry and to bitter rather than to forgive? That's why James 1.22 says this, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Verse 26, If anyone among you thinks he is religious, if you think you are a matured Christian, if you think you are a spiritual person, and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's spirituality, this one's religion, this one's maturity is useless. In other words, you know, if you think you're spiritual, but you don't bridle your tongue, you don't control what you say, you don't act, you don't lift out the word of God, not just talking about the tongue. You know, it's about talking about your lifestyle. Because in those days, a lot of Christians were going around slandering and gossiping. Not much different today, right? Still the same. Huh? We never changed in 2,000 years. All right? And you know, and I still, I still get a lot of these things, you know. You know, you talk about emails. Sometimes you'll get a lot of things on emails, right? I don't know, throughout the century, I mean, not the century, throughout the years, I received so many emails about, come on, you all need to boycott McDonald's because McDonald's give half the proceeds to Satan. You need to boycott Procter and Gamble because Procter and Gamble, uh, the CEO is a Satan worshipper. You need to boycott uh, Starbucks because Starbucks has the logo of a siren, which is a god goddess or something, and so you need and they, and they worship that goddess. You know, let me tell you this, friends. When we do that things, when we do such things, we spread such things, we are no different from gossipers and slanderers because 99.9 percent of those things are not true. 99.9% of those things are just made up. They are just hoax. They are just lies. And when we spread them around, we are just as slanderous. We are, we are not bridling our tongue. Today, you don't have to use your tongue. You can just bridle your email or bridle your WhatsApp or bridle your handphone. And we don't do that. And so what the Bible is saying is when you don't practice what you hear, when you don't apply what you know, that maturity is useless. That religion is useless. And that's why it is so hard to keep doing good and right because it's easier to do, to just, I mean, it's so hard to be mature because it's just easier to default back to knowledge. Because it's so easy, I just need to know. I mean, let's be honest. I want to know. Uh, just take a book and read. I know more already. Lah. Or the easiest way, just come and sit down and Sunday sermon, listen to a sermon, you know a bit more than you did last week already. So easy. But to do, that takes effort. That will cost. That takes a price to pay. Because you have to now have to act on it. You have to put it into practice. You have to apply it. And that ain't easy. So how do we grow in maturity and not just being knowledgeable? How do we grow? Well, we should write to me next point. To grow in maturity, we need to have firstly a teachable heart. A teachable heart. You need to have okay, I say you need to discern good and evil. And as our understanding of good and evil, as we grow, our understanding of good and evil will also grow. I mean, as a child, as a kindergarten children or a Sunday school children, we understand good and evil as go to church is good, stay, uh, don't, uh, if you're pointing church, if you skip church, it's bad. That's their understanding of good and evil. And it's okay for a five-year-old, it's okay for a four-year-old to understand go to church is good, Go stay at home, watch TV is bad. It's good for them to understand that way. But as you grow older, you need to understand that it's not just good, it's not just about coming to church and parking yourself here. Good is about being connected to a community, about being encouraging one another, being accountable to the community, being, being part of a fellowship, being encouraging and edifying each other in a community. But the problem is many of us, we never learn. We never grow in our knowledge. 
And because of that, we have a very Sunday school understanding of good and evil. And we just still think that good is going to church on Sunday. So as long as I come to church, I'm seated here, I'm doing good. Whether or not I, or I listen, whether or not I practice, whether or not I enjoy, whether or not I'm fellowshipping with people, as long as I just show up, I'm doing good. Because we never grow from a Sunday school understanding of good and evil. And so what happens is we are no less knowledgeable than when we first became a Christian. When we are first in a Sunday school, because we stop learning the minute we graduated from Sunday school or the minute we finish baptism class, we stop grow, we stop learning. But for to be mature, we need to have a teachable heart. A heart that always desires to learn. A heart whose default mode is learning. You know, let's be honest. Our default mode as humans is not to learn, you know. How many of you have a default mode of learning? Most of us don't. You know, when we were young, when we were in school, yes, our default mode is learning. When we go to school, when we, but most of us, by the time we graduate from college, our default mode changes. Learning is no longer automatic. It's no longer a default mode for us. Learning now becomes intentional. It becomes a chore. You have to force yourself to learn. That's why it's so easy for children to learn things, you know. It's so easy for young children to learn things. You give them an iPad, after two days they learn everything. They know how to do everything already. It's so easy for them to learn because learning is their default mode. You know, it's like my daughter that day. We were driving uh, around. We were just talking. Um, me and my wife were talking about uh, putting money in bank and fixed deposit and things like that. Then my daughter started asking me, Daddy, how come, why you put money in bank and then they give you interest? One, uh? And then she keep asking questions. Why you put money in ATM you can machine? You can draw money from ATM machine. Why, why banks will give loans and everything? And so in that short period, I had to explain the entire banking system and economics to a seven-year-old girl. But you see their hunger for learning? They just want to learn. They just want to know. But somehow as we grow older, maybe because we think we know everything already, that desire stops. That default mode stops. And that's why, uh, with all respect to the elderly, now you know why it's so difficult to teach elder, older people how to use a handphone. It's so difficult to teach them how to use emails and to, uh, to use uh, whatever, you know, Astro, even DVD players and these other things, you know. Because uh, you, you, the default mode is we just stop learning. And we find learning so difficult. But when it comes to the things of God, we need to have this teachable heart to always desire to learn and to learn and to learn. And the key to that, the key is humility. That's why God says in Hosea 4, I say, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You see, when we think we know everything, when we think we know all that we need to know, when in reality all we know is a Sunday school understanding of good and evil, then we begin to discern good and evil not according to God's ways, but according to my understanding, what the world teaches, what I learned from life, and what I learned from Sunday school maybe. I begin to discern good and evil according to my ways, not God's ways. And so what becomes good in the eyes of God becomes bad and old-fashioned in our eyes. And what becomes bad in the eyes of God becomes important, vital, the trend, it becomes our future. And all those things become so important to us because that is now good and evil. I mean, it's good in our eyes when in reality it's evil in God's eyes. So what we need, the key to that is humility. An honest humility before God to just admit that I don't know everything. I just don't. There's so much more that I need to learn. There's still so much more about God that I don't understand. There's still so much more about my own life that I do not know. My appetites, my desires, my cravings, my tendencies. There's so many things about my own sinful self that I do not know. And sometimes we're just clouded by it because we just do not know our own nature well. The things that blind us, I just don't know. And we need to realize that. We just need to have this, this sincerity before God that I just don't know. And we just need to have that teachable heart like a child once again. You know? That's why the Bible, Jesus says, you know, you need to have a faith like a little child. Not just a faith like a little child that, you know, you just believe like a little child. But you're also teachable like a little child. I remember my son, Erwin, that day, for a season of time, he began to learn differently now, but a season of time, 
he would, because I would tell him things like, okay, you cannot touch, you cannot play that toy without daddy. Okay, when daddy say can, only you can play that toy. Understand? Okay. Then months later, one day he wants to play that toy. He asks, Daddy, can I play that toy? And I didn't hear him ask. My wife heard and my wife said, Yeah, can go ahead, take. She looked at the mother. Daddy, can I play that toy? Then my wife said, Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. Daddy, can or not? I said, No, go ahead. And my wife said, Go ahead. Say, then he come back and keep asking Daddy, Daddy, can or not? Can or not? Until my wife gets so angry at him, he said, Hey, mommy already said can, why must you keep asking Daddy? Sometimes they're just, so teacher, they're just so teachable because at one point in their life, I, I taught him, unless daddy say can, you can't do it. And he just learns that way. And sometimes we need that kind of teachable heart. Just teachability from God, just a teachable heart to God. And secondly, we need to grow in maturity. We need to have consistent practice. Hebrews 5.14 says this, But solid food belongs to those who are full of age. That is those who by reason of use reason of you, you keep using it over and over again, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. It's reason of use by exercising, by constantly practicing to choose good, by constantly practicing to apply good. You see, one of the, like I told you, mature counterfeits comes in 25% silver. It comes in 25% original. And many times for us, we think that we, that we do choose good. Yeah, I did. Ten years ago when God told me to do something, I did it. Fifteen years ago when I had to choose between uh, buying a new car or giving my tithes to God, I gave 10% to God. And we think that just because throughout my whole life, there were moments of choosing good. There were moments of discerning good and choosing good. We are matured. Friends, no. Maturity comes from a constant practice. A constant practice. 25% of choosing good doesn't make seven, the other 75% mature. It comes from a constant practice of doing good. You see, we humans are creatures of habits. Isn't that true? We get used to something once we do it. And when we constantly choose God's way, we constantly choose God's God's uh, definition of good and evil. We constantly choose God's priorities in our life. It becomes a habit. It becomes automatic. You know, it's like, I mean, all of us are creatures of habit, right? You all have your habits in the morning, right? You wake up, you will have a certain thing you do, you have a certain thing you eat, you have a certain thing you, routine that you do. All of us have habits. We are creatures of habit. Even right now, every one of you are seated within two or three seats from where you every, sit every Sunday. You don't move very far. We are all creatures of habit. We are always where we do, we do it over and over again. And that can work both ways. And here's a warning, friends. When we consistently choose good, it practices that in us. It builds that up in our lives. It builds maturity in us. But the same is true the other way. When we consistently and constantly choose not to follow, when we consistently choose not to apply what we know, when we consistently choose to ignore that tugging of the Holy Spirit in our heart that, hey, maybe we should, do, we should stop doing this, then what happens is it hardens our heart. The same thing is true both ways. When we consistently choose good, it builds maturity. When we consistently choose the other way, it hardens our heart. And it makes it so much easier for us the next time to choose to ignore. The first time when we, have, when, when we discern, okay, this is God's way, this is what I prefer, but this is God's way. Never mind, lah, one time only. After all, yesterday I already obeyed God, but today I choose differently. Lah. Then the next time it comes again, it becomes easier. Another time, ah, yeah, Holy Spirit, tugging my heart. Lah. Okay, lah, never mind. Lah. I pray for one hour. After that, I feel better already. I can do this. Then after sooner or later, the tugging also goes away. And whenever we come and discern, we still discern, we know that, yeah, maybe this should be the right way, but uh, yeah, I prefer this. And it becomes so easy for us to just go the other way. And our hearts become so hardened, we no longer hear the tugging of the Holy Spirit. We no longer hear, even though you can hear a thousand sermons, 
we will still not hear and not discern what's wrong, what's, what's, what's wrong in our lives. We are all growing, like it or not, we are all growing. Whether you are growing in maturity or growing in immaturity, it depends on you. But we are all growing. I just want to close, you know, in my, my own self, during my, I got saved in my college days when I went to university, that's when I got saved. And being a, a not so not bright kid, I managed to grow very fast in knowledge. You know, I got saved in my first year in university. Within the first year itself, I began to read the Bible. Again, I finished the whole Bible in a couple of months. I read up books. I read up things. And before I knew it, boom, I had an explosion of knowledge. I knew every, all the theology. I knew the doctrines. I can even debate with the Christians who are much older about why this doctrine is right, why that doctrine is wrong. I began to grow. I began to know everything about the Bible to the point that I begin, even within the one year, two years, I begin to be the teacher in the, in the group. I begin to teach others about uh, like, things like baptism class. I begin to do doctrinal teachings. I begin to do Bible studies. I begin to do all this sort of teaching because I just grew so fast. But what I didn't realize was that although I was growing so much in knowledge, I wasn't getting matured. The people around me didn't know. They all look at me and say, wow, you see this Andrew? What a good testimony. You know, from the from first year like this, now after one year, see how much he has grown, how much more matured he has become. But in the back of my mind, I know that there's no change. There were not much changes in my life. I still did the things that I was doing. I still behaved the way I was behaving. I was still, I still had the same attitude as I had. I still had the same uh, character that I had. And it took the Lord in my third year or fourth year where I actually had to backslide before I realized that I was counterfeiting maturity in my life. And I thank God that by His grace, He brought me into repentance. He brought me back into His fold. Otherwise, I may not even be here today. But one lesson I learned, and I'm still learning, is that maturity can be so easily counterfeited. Because it doesn't depend on how much we know, but it depends on how much we are applying in our lives. And my prayer for you this morning is that you don't wait. That you don't have to wait. You don't have to wait for calamity to strike you. You don't have to wait for sickness to come upon you. You don't have to wait for near-death experiences to realize that all you are having, if you are having a counterfeit maturity, you can do that now by examining your lives, by looking at how much in your lives you are actually doing and how much you only know. Let us pray. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all honour and all glory. And Lord, this evening we ask for your this morning we ask for your spirit to come and speak to us again. Search our hearts, Lord. Search every soul who's here this morning. Lord, if we are having a maturity that is based on knowledge and not action, Lord, may you awaken us. May you our heart so strongly that we cannot deny it. Help us to realize, Lord, that maturity is not just a one-off action of obedience, but it's a consistent lifestyle of putting into practice what we know. Lord, search our hearts, Lord. And even before the day is over, if those of us here seated here right now if we have been living our lives by counterfeiting maturity with knowledge all this while, Lord, may you convict us so strongly. May you, give, may you not give us a good night's sleep until we repent. May you trouble our hearts so deeply 
that until we repent, we will not have your peace. Lord, I just commit each and every one of us under your hands. May you search our hearts and change our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.